Okay, I think we can get rolling here. So thanks everybody for joining us for this online discussion of a better future for Minnesota families. We're gonna talk about some ideas for improving support for parents and for youth who end up in, in foster care. My name is John Kelly. I am the uh, co-executive director of the, excuse me, sorry for the slides moving, uh, the co-executive director of Fostering Media Connections. We're a national nonprofit that uses the power of media and journalism to, to lead the conversation about children, youth, and families in America. And Fostering Media Connections has three kind of central components to it. We publish the imprint, which is a daily news site covering child welfare, youth justice, youth homelessness around the country. Uh, we have reporting hubs in California, in New York, in Minnesota, in Washington, and Texas. Um, we also publish the bi-monthly magazine, Fostering Families Today, which goes right into the homes of resource parents, whether they're, they're foster parents, licensed parents, kinship caregivers, what have you. Um, and we also have our youth voice program through which we work with young people, youth and young adults with lived experience in these systems uh, to, to train them and to, to work with them on how to kind of express their reflections on the system, write op ads, things like that. So um, uh, I want to uh, just pause here and kind of give a little bit of an overview of like what we're trying to do with, with this event today. There's a national conversation going on around how to prioritize family connections and child welfare responses, lower the system's reliance on family separation, but also, and also to confront and address, you know, inequities both in the, the upstream early parts of the child welfare system and later for it for youth and care. And this is as important a conversation in Minnesota as it is anywhere in this country. Minnesota saw the number of children removed from parents nearly double from 2010 to 2018. Uh, that was from about 5,000 to nearly 10,000. That number has declined somewhat, but it's still well above that 5,000 average. Um, the state has dramatically and, and largely safely increased the invo involvement of relatives and other kin in the care of children known to the system. The percentage of days spent in foster care that were with kin in Minnesota rose from 40% in 2014. It's now up to about 62% today. But at the same time, Minnesota is among those states with the most severe disproportionality rates when it comes to children entering foster care. According to recent state data in Minnesota, Native American children are 16.8 times as likely to experience foster care as white children are. Black children are 2.6 times as likely uh, for every three white children in foster care in the state, there are seven black children um, and 30 Native American youth. So, so our goal today is to hear from several leaders in the state with different perspectives on the Minnesota child welfare system about specific actionable ideas that the state should be thinking about as it contemplates how to improve child welfare big picture. And that's preventing families and children from ever coming into contact with it better protections and supports for those who do, and better treatment of the young people who do enter foster care. So we, we asked each of our panelists all independently to come up with you know, the one actionable idea that they would most like to see uh, implemented to improve things. All of them have many more than one idea, but we just asked for the, for the purposes of this exercise that they, they hone in on one. So I wanna introduce our panel and then we can really get going hearing from them. Um, we have Ali Hanton Ebert, uh, who's the executive director of the Jeremiah Program's Rochester campus. We have Dr. Damian Fair, who is the director of the Masonic Institute for the Developing Brain at the University of Minnesota. And we have Natalie Netzel, uh, who is the education and advocacy director of the Institute to Transform Child Protection at the Mitchell Hamline School of Law. We have Shannon Smith, the executive director of the Indian Child Welfare Act Law Center. And then uh, we have a late addition to the panel that I sadly was not able to, to get into the slide, but we're, we're super happy to that we'll round out with a tag team presentation from Hong Murphy, who is the uh, founder and executive director of Fostering Advocates, and Detrice Edwards, uh, who is a proud mother of two, has nine years of lived experience in Minnesota's foster care system, and continues to support her own younger siblings who, who are in Stay care. So Detrice has joined us late. Um, I apologize that you aren't on the uh, the speakers uh, panel here, but uh, we are, we're super happy to have you on the, uh, the discussion. So just quickly before I move to that portion of this, um, two, one thing to note, uh, 
Well, first, let me just first thank um, the Sauer Family Foundation, who was uh, generous in helping us to make this event happen, but also supports our independent journalism uh, covering child welfare in Minnesota, for, you know, for years now. So we really appreciate their uh, investment in us to, to kind of help raise the discussion. Um, finally, just last thing before we begin, we really want to hear from anybody who was uh, a participant today, what you thought of this panel what you liked about it, what you would like to see us do events or coverage on um, in the future. Uh, this is my direct email uh, address, jkelly at fosteringmediaconnections.org. We'll also try to get some questions and, and feedback during the discussion today if we have time. If you have a question or comment, throw that into the chat uh, section of the, uh, of the Zoom meetup. So enough of me, let's move on to Allie Han Niebert, who, as I mentioned, leads the Rochester operation of the Jeremiah program, which, which grew, it's in multiple states now, but really grew out of Minnesota and kind of focuses in a laser like fashion on ending the cycle of poverty for a single mother. So, Allie, what's, what's your idea for improving Minnesota support for families? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me today, John. Um, so, my focus today is really going to be around prevention. Um, and that's what I really want to focus on. And that's kind of where Jeremiah focuses on and, and kind of offering some pillars of support to our families to help um, find their way out of poverty so that their families aren't living generationally in poverty. And um, what we see is that the systems that we can put in place to help disrupt generational poverty are the same kind of protective factor systems that we can use to keep families out of the child, child welfare and, and keep them safe at home. Um, and so that's what I want to focus on today a little bit. So we can move on to the next slide. Can I do that or is, is that somebody else? Oh, I got you. I'll do it. It's fine. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right, so we're going to start with kind of the actionable items that Minnesota can take. Um, again, these aren't small feats, right? These aren't quick and easy or simple. Um, and some of them cost money, which is kind of a, a crucial piece in investing in our families and investing in our communities is putting our money um, in those areas as well. Um, so the first, the first idea um, is to increase funding for free or sliding fee scale child development centers. Um, and what we know about prevention is that one of the pillars of prevention is really making sure our kids have a safe and stable place to be during the day um, so that their parents can work and provide. Because um, when parents are forced to make really hard decisions about who cares for their children so that they can provide for their families, that's when we find ourselves in situations where we're entering the welfare system. And so if we put things in place like either universal child care or universal preschool or funding programs that are already established to provide free or low cost child care, we can really build some protective factors in to help support our families who are more at risk. Um, the second one is increase. Oh, sorry. Can you oh, go back one? My bad. Yeah. Um, the second one is to increase child care assistance rates at the state level. So Minnesota has one of the most disproportionately low um, child care assistance rates across the country. Um, right now, it's currently about 25% of child care costs. There's actually a bill um, presented um, right now that would be uh, geared towards increasing the child care assistance rates, which would allow more child care facilities to accept child care assistance because it would cover the costs of child care. Um, and then it would allow families to actually be able to utilize it at places that are safe and, um, and really equitable um, and high quality. Um, and then the last one would be increasing funding for family support and parent education programs. And again, this kind of leans into the pillars that we'll get into here. But what we know is that when families have their concrete needs met and their emotional needs met and kind of understand what's developmentally appropriate their child, we can then increase our protective factors to keep families safe and out of the welfare system. So if you can, you can jump, go on to the next one now, John. All right. So. First, I want to focus on kind of what we do here at Jeremiah, and then we'll talk about kind of the why behind that. So 
Jeremiah's program, as John mentioned, is to disrupt generational poverty two generations at a time for single mothers and their children. And so we do that through some key ways, right? So first is providing free on-site child development for all of our families who are participating in the program. Some of our programs are residential, meaning that they live on campus with us. Some of our programs are non-residential, but they are still partnering with high quality child development centers to provide that at no cost to families. And so in, in Rochester, we have 40 units where families live on site um, and at their feet on the first floor is a full child development center that their, their children can attend birth through school age. Um, and that really reduces the barrier, right? We know that um, not a lot of child care centers accept child care assistance because of the cost of the reimbursement rates, um, which means that we're making choices about where we're bringing our kids or who's watching our kids so that we can provide for families. Um, and so providing that free on site really is a barrier reducer. Um, and what we see is when we reduce barriers like housing and child support, it allows our parents to really focus on kind of their aspirations, to kind of unleash their full potential um, that is kind of being stifled by intenable choices of having to make a choice like I have to work a full-time minimum wage job versus advancing my education because I have to pay for my apartment, right? So second, we provide coaching support on concrete resources, resources to meet needs, um, parent and child development education, supporting and advancing um, education. And again, those are all gonna be some of those protective factors that we talk about in, in the next slide here. Um, but what's important is that our families all have somebody who can kind of act as an advocate, act as a support person, um, and really build um, kind of their network of capacity so that they can succeed in, in their, their educational goals. And lastly, we focus on something that we call sisterhood, um, which is really developing your social connections and your social networks. Anybody who is a parent knows how hard it is to parent alone. Um, and most people don't parent alone, right? Whether you have a partner that lives with you, whether you rely on family, friends, whatever that looks like, most of us have a network of people that we can rely on to help with our children. And so that's really important for us at Jeremiah to make sure that we are helping our moms build a social network so that they have people to lean on, they have people to invest in them emotionally um, and support them in kind of those concrete times of like, my kid's sick, they can't go to daycare, can you help me, right? Um, so those are areas that we put in place. And what's really interesting is that these are things that we put in place specifically to disrupt generational poverty, but what we see is they run a parallel process to disrupting um, and keeping our kids out of the child care welfare system because they align so closely with those protective factors. You can go on to the next slide. Can you advance to the next slide for me, John? I think it. It did for me. Did it not show up for you yet? Not yet. There we go. Perfect. Thank Sorry. you. <laughs> nope, no worries. I think my internet might be a little leggy over here. Um, so these are kind of the why behind what we do, right? So why do we offer coaching support? So what we know is that there are five key protective factors that help offset parenting stress and make children and families safer. Um, and so that's parent resilience. And how do we build that? We build that through um, connection, through relationships, um, through knowledge, and all of those help build resiliency to kind of offset those times of high stress. Um, social connection, which we just talked about. How do we build networks for families so that they can have people to depend on? Um, because we know that our families who um, are in really hard situations often feel like they don't have anybody to lean on. And when you don't have anybody to lean on, you're forced to make hard decisions that go against kind of all of your innate parenting um, intuition, but are a necessity to kind of make sure that you're able to provide for your children. Um, concrete supports in times of need. Do you have somebody that you can reach out when you need groceries, when you need help making your rent payments? You know, like those kind of concrete supports, like you have somebody to reach out to for those. And then knowledge of parenting and child development. Um, parenting, some parts are really innate and intuitive and some parts are not at all. And so it's really helpful to have somebody kind of walk alongside you and help understand like, what are age appropriate expectations, right? What are things that we should be expecting from our kids and what are things that are, what we kind of call annoying but normal behaviors, right? From our kids that help set realistic expectations for our parents. Um, and then help our kids succeed in, in kind of the tertiary results. 
Um, and then lastly, developing the social and emotional competency of our children. And that's where that two generational approach really comes in handy for us. Um, and why we focus so specifically on that in Jeremiah is because we wanna make sure that our kids are well taken care of, not just you know kindergarten ready, can they do their ABCs and one, two, threes, but do they understand what it means to be a part of a group and to raise their hand and to stand in line and to share and um, are, are they taken care of emotionally, right? Um, do they have an ability to express their emotion and do they feel comforted and taken care of? Um, those are all things that we really focus on in our coaching support and in our time in Jeremiah. And then secondary, why universal child care, right? Why do we focus on uh, the two generational support and why does that mean free and, and on-site child care, right? So what we know is that children can be 18 months behind by the start of kindergarten. Children not kindergarten ready are half as likely to read by third grade. And children who are not reading proficiently by third grade are four times more likely to drop out of high school. So what we see is all of these have predicted behaviors for their future progress. And if we kind of map that out even further, right? If you're not a college graduate or a high school graduate, what does that mean for your career? What does that mean for living in generational poverty? What does that mean in terms of risk factors to, you know, that might enter you into the child welfare system, right? And so all of these things are related. And so by preventing these things from the beginning and saying like, we're gonna offer free and on-site childcare, what we're doing is building in those protective factors to help make sure that they're kindergarten ready make sure that they're reading proficiently, you know, which kind of sets them up to read proficiently by third grade, which then predicts their ability to graduate high school and pursue a college education. And the other piece of, which is a tie back tie kind of our coaching support is there are studies that show that mothers who participate in parent mentoring programs or home visitation programs, parent education programs um, for their infants and toddlers, their toddlers are recording higher math and reading scores throughout third grade, right? So it's all intertwined and it's all connected. And when we focus on these things on the front end, we don't have to, you know, focus so much on how to be reactive to it, right? When we focus on prevention, we're allowed um, to kind of keep, keep our kids safe at home with their parents who can be successful and get the support that they need. What well, questions so can I no, I think we'll go through everybody's ideas and then we'll probably get to a little round table. I'd, I'd love to kind of ask everybody to, to, to react to what they've heard from their, their co-panelists and take some from the, from the chat, which by the way, I said it earlier, but if you have a question for any of our panelists, throw that into the chat for us and we will get to as many as, uh, as we can. So let me uh, thank you, Allie, for that. And uh, let's, uh, let's go next to Dr. Damian Fair, who is the Director of the Masonic Institute for the Developing Brain at the University of Minnesota. So Dr. Fair, you recently won a, I'm not, I won't brag too much for you, but you won a MacArthur Genius Award for your contributions to the body of knowledge about brain development. That's a pretty big deal. And the impact of, you know, direct trauma and intergenerational trauma on the young brain. So you're, you're at a couple thousand feet above in terms of what you do day to day. But, um, you know, of course, it's laws and funding priorities and policies that are the path towards taking kind of what you guys have learned and actually making it a reality in the lives of families. So I'm just curious, you know, what are you, what does the growing body of, of knowledge on child brain development suggest to you in terms of what Minnesota should, should be doing more of? Yeah, well, well, thank you for having me. It's, I'm, I'm happy to speak, you know, the child welfare system is not, it's not directly in my, my body work, but I, what I can tell you is that, you know, we have been um, thinking a, a lot, particularly at the, the new Masonic Institute of Developing Brain, thinking quite a bit about how to bridge the basics of what we know in the basic sciences to inform how to prioritize and think through um, specific policies. And so I think um, I really enjoyed Ellie's um, discussion just before this because it fits right into the way that we've been thinking about this quite a bit. Um, in terms of the basic science and brain development. Now, I'm a neuroscientist, and so I cannot um, have this discussion about without talking about the brain and how the brain develops, because it is, it is actually very important to think through how, how that works. And again, it helps think through why some of the things that Ali was just discussing is actually so important for improving um, overall child health, and in particular, preventing some of the 
um, uh, you know, some of the uh, circumstances that are, that are being seen by the child welfare system. So one of the initiatives that we're, we're integrating right now at, at, the, at MIDB is this idea of the first one, um, the first 1000 days. Um, so why don't I, if you go to the, if you just go to the next slide, I'll, I'll, I'll just kick in here. So this is just, this is the only slide I'll show and everything else I'll just be talking, okay? Now this, this picture right here, is, it, in essence, shows the making of the brain, you know, and all the way from the conception and the way left of the graph, all the way through the end of life, which is apparently on this graph is about the age of 60. <laughs> maybe, a little, maybe a little early, but I, I think you kind of get the picture. Now, what you can see on this, uh, on this uh, image is that the large majority of making of the brain happens between conception and when you're about, you know, two to three years old, you know, the, the, this maximal growth in the, in the brain is occurring then. That's when all the neuro, neurons you're almost ever going to be born, ever have for the rest of your life are, 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 are happen then. Uh, that's when the, they start making the connections that spread throughout the entire brain. That's called the synaptogenesis there. That's when they migrate to their final resting place. You know, the, the brain can usually, how it works, it over peripherates, you know, all the different neurons and connections and then kind of prunes them back over time. In fact, I, I oftentimes, as an analogy, I talk about how the brain is built more like how you might carve out a statue than it is than you build a house. You know, where you build a house, you have a foundation, you start building up things and you, you build into the final, you know, adult house. Well, the brain more you have, essentially it builds a humongous rock and then over the over age, you just kind of start whittling that rock until you get the final sculpture. And that's what, that's essentially how the, the brain develops. Making that big rock that you're gonna whittle off of, that, that, that in essence is occurring from conception to three years old. Um, and your capacity to learn, the trajectories you're gonna be on for the rest of your life, all is kicking off, kicking off right then. And so this period of time with the first 1000 days is extremely important um, in the long-term long -term trajectories. Now, if you, if you, the large majority of, you know, um, of the support systems that are built in our society are typically, uh, you're, they typically, particularly in kids, are typically around school ages, you know, some about five to 18 years old. You know, the school lunches, there's obviously a lot of childcare because you're, you're in public school. So a lot of, there's a lot of support structures that are just exist naturally after the age of five, but before, but before then, there's, um, there's, uh, quite a, there's quite less. And so in order to improve, you know, on some of those investments, essentially that we make in the school age, we need to start doing a lot of the same things that are that you, you that are kind of come naturally in much earlier ages, you know, prenatally, of course, but even from zero, zero to three years, three years old. So, uh, you know, it's interesting. So right now there are there are actually several efforts in the legislature in the at, in, in Minnesota to um, to improve on some of the support structures for these very early years. Um, some of this is kicked off by efforts by uh, Representative Dave Pinto. And I have to, I have to make sure I, I say this is that my, um, I don't really, we're, we're not really, we're not really supposed to be endorsing specific legislation. So if you're, if you're from the Minnesota, you know, the University of Minnesota as a, as a faculty member, but as a private citizen, I can, you know, so I can tell you the things that I, I wanted the, as a private as a private citizen, and I and I can tell you that there the there's some efforts. One's I believe it's called the Affordable High Quality Early Care and Education of All Families that are trying to do a few different things that I think is very important that will will certainly help and, and help reduce some of the pressures on the systems over the long term. One of these things that it's doing is it's trying to make uh, childcare universally affordable at these particularly in these very young ages. Um, Again, just like Ali was saying, a lot, a lot of times, just the stress of not have not having the ability to, you know, have those types of support structures that come naturally at later ages can cause a lot of burden at the most critical time of brain development, right? Um, the, the the other part is to reduce some of the inequities in the quality of care at, at these early, early ages. 
So there is, there's lots of structural in, um, inequalities that we have to handle. And, and I think access to uh, quality childcare is one of them. And so that, that's another thing these bills hits. And the, and, the, and the last is improving the living wages of some of these or some of these kind of caregivers can really help support uh, the early development is at these very early, earliest years. So this is work that's being being handled in the the early childhood finance and policy committees um, by Dave Pinto. There's there's um, there's some efforts on the even on the on the GOP side by Senator Ebola from from Minoka, uh, from uh, Senator Carla Hansen from Rochester area. That are that are all trying to target some support structures at these very earliest ages, and as I was kind of just highlighting, as far as like as what we know, you know, it's how the brain develops. This is this kind of these kind of support structures are going to be really critical for preventing, you know, you know um, and for preventing some of the some of the situation that we see in child welfare system. So being able to partner with the parents to identify, you know, and access these resources um, can help again prevent the stress that kind of sometimes can precipitate child maltreatment um, by helping families meet their basic needs um, and devote more time to the child's well-being. You know, all that stuff can really help um, support uh, in, in children's development that is at risk, particularly at early ages. So I'll, I'll end there, but those are, that's, again, from a brain, from a brain perspective, that very early time period is very critical that we, that we make sure we have support structures and we actually have some actionable items that are being considered as we speak that in, in, at, in the state legislature in, in, in Minnesota that could, that could help us with that endeavor. I think it's, you know, thank you, Dr. Perrin. I, I think it's really you, the, the first two ideas here that you've heard today may sound pretty similar, right? And I think that that is, um, it's, it's pretty impactful to me because I asked everybody on here to come up with their idea independently. And you just heard from one leader at one of the organizations in this country most focused on directly improving the lives of and helping single parents. And one of the foremost researchers on, on the child brain development. And, and they both just, you know, like early quality childcare is a common denominator uh, for both of them. So I, I appreciate your guys' uh, input on this. So N Natalie Netzel, I want to go to you next. You, uh, Natalie is the, um, the heads up education and advocacy at the, the Institute to Transform Child Protection, which is run by, again, the Mitchell Hamline School of Law. So uh, Natalie, I think the average person probably doesn't realize that in child welfare courts, due process rights to an attorney for parents involved are kind of much murkier than in criminal court. You know, most states do require the appointment of legal counsel to parents. It might not be until after a child's been removed from them. It may not even be until they have a hearing about terminating a parent's rights. So you guys have been active in this space in Minnesota. Talk to us about the current state of legal access in the state and what, the, what your guys' biggest idea uh, is for making change here. Yeah, thank you so much, John. It's an absolute honor to be here to talk about how to create a better future for Minnesota families. Um, so as part of my role at the law school, I supervise law students who are providing direct representation to kin and parents in the child welfare system. And we're really lucky in that we're able to provide holistic and interdisciplinary representation, meaning we also have master's level social work interns who work in tandem with our law school or our law students to support our clients. And that's really important as a grounding point for my idea in that in my experience, I just consistently see the presence of this false dichotomy that parents and kids' interests are at odds. When the reality of families that I work with is that this is so very true or so rarely true. We support kids when we support parents. And so listening to what my fellow panelists have said, I wanna add that I want my job representing families in the welfare system to be absolutely absolute, obsolete and that anything we can do to prevent entry into the child welfare system, we need to do. So one critical way is to provide high quality legal representation for parents. And the research supports this in that there's been, an, in 2019, there was an empirically rigorous study commissioned by Casey Family Programs that compared case outcomes over a period of 10 years where some parents were represented by solo court-appointed attorneys and 
Other parents were represented by professionals who were part of a multidisciplinary law office. Children whose parents had attorneys from multidisciplinary multi law offices had significantly better outcomes. And by that, I mean reduced time in foster care, increase in kin placement, faster reunification, and most importantly, none of these metrics came at the expense of child safety. Minnesota has a long way to go in terms of providing parents with high quality representation. So John, to talk about the due process that's afforded being murky in Minnesota, uh, that's an understatement. So by my last count, Minnesota is one of only six states left who do not currently mandate counsel for parents. Our current statute is discretionary in a very problematic way, meaning it provides indigent parents can be provided counsel in any case where the court feels such appointment is appropriate. And so we can pause on that for a second. Currently, whether a parent gets counsel in Minnesota is subject to the feelings of the court. As a lawyer, that language is pretty absurd to me and the results are devastating. Accurate data has been really hard to come by but two summers ago, our institute reached out to court administration in all 87 counties to ask. At the hearing where children are removed from their parents and a judge signs off on that removal, that destruction of the family, did parents in that county have an attorney present at that hearing? In over half of the counties, the answer to that question was no, meaning we are taking children from their families without legal counsel by the side of the parent. Some hopeful news on that front about how change is possible in Minnesota and we're a few days premature. We introduced a bill to mandate counsel for all indigent parents at all stages of the proceeding. It's part of the HHS omnibus bill. Fingers crossed it's gonna come to a floor vote this weekend and hopefully it'll be passed and signed by the governor sometime next week. It's huge, it is so huge that this might happen. And while I'm over the moon about that, mandating counsel for parents is merely the first step. We actually need to ensure that parents receive high quality representation, like the kind from that 2019 study out of New York. The current state of court appointed counsel in Minnesota varies so greatly from county to county. So many problems, and I'm gonna name just a few. Counties select and pay for parent attorneys on a contract basis, meaning they're rarely full-time positions. They don't come with benefits or support staff. The contracts often go to the lowest bidder. Parent attorneys who zealously advocate for their clients, and there certainly are some wonderful parent attorneys in Minnesota, those parent attorneys get labeled as difficult and then they risk losing their contracts. And while parents maintain this discretionary right to court appointed counsel, when they want to appeal a judge's decision, we have no system in place to reliably connect those parents with attorneys on appeal. Parents who don't trust their attorneys because they think their attorneys work and are paid for by the county, the agency that removed their child from them, they're not wrong. And some most of the egregious circumstances I'm aware of, parent attorneys have been limited the number of hours they can get paid to work on a case. One instance, I heard of an attorney who could only be paid four hours per month to work on a case. And she had a hearing that in a single day was over four hours. So what do we need to do to make some necessary change improvements to change parent representation, which we know benefits kids? I think we need a centralized office for parent rep in Minnesota to ensure that parent attorneys are adequately supported so they can adequately advocate for their clients and support their clients. This office, could allow parent attorneys and parents access to social work support. And I mean, social work support that work on behalf of the parents, true licensed social workers, um, as opposed to uh, an agency caseworker. Um, access to parent mentors, access to other people on a multidisciplinary team. Manage contracting, meaning parent attorneys are paid adequately, consistently, and paid for all of the work they do, which will incentivize them to do more work on behalf of their clients provide ongoing training and technical assistance to ensure that parent attorneys are knowledgeable on child welfare law, but not only that, that they are trauma-informed and culturally competent. 
an office that can utilize principles of community engagement to ensure that our most marginalized voices are central to the conversation and the work to eradicate disparity and disproportionality of families of color needlessly subjected to child welfare involvement. I also leave parent attorneys feeling like they're part of a team, not just solo practitioners left standing alone, which makes it really hard to do their job effectively when they're oftentimes the most disliked person in the courtroom and ensure that every parent has access to an attorney on appeal. It matters for individuals. It matters for their individual cases. Appeals are also a check on district court practice. More generally, they make attorneys and judges pay close attention to what the law actually says. That's a huge part of the battle. A lot of our law in Minnesota is parent and child friendly. It's good, but we actually need to make sure that we're reading and relying upon and acting upon those legislative directives. Other states have done this with great results and we can too. We know far too much about the harms that our system causes and we owe this and so much more to any child that our state considers removing from their family. Awesome, thank you, Natalie. Um, we're gonna stay in the legal space. Shannon Smith also works in uh, child welfare law in the state, but in a kind of a particular corner of it that has pretty significant importance uh, for Minnesota. So for those on the, uh, on the discussion here that uh, aren't, aren't really familiar with this, there was a law passed in the 1970s called the Indian Child Welfare Act, very often known as just ICWA. Uh, it requires that when a child is identified as being a member of a Native American tribe, Shannon, you can, you can correct me if I get any of this overview wrong, but you know that um, a higher threshold of efforts, you know, active efforts instead of reasonable efforts and, and, and other provisions you know, must be made. And this, this became law at a time when in the 70s, you know, up to a third of Native American children were, were being taken into foster care and placed in residential schools or with white adoptive parents. So the center that Shannon leads really focuses entirely on cases where ICWA applies. Um, and that's, that's cool because it's pretty rare. There's definitely not a lot of specialty around the country on these issues. And Shannon was also recently kind of nice enough to, to put her staff to work with the imprint to access, you know, a, a month's worth of their cases and really look at it uh, to report on kind of what the everyday impact is of, of ICWA now. So Shannon, what would you say is the most pressing actionable thing Minnesota needs to consider in order to improve the, the state's support for families based on your guys' experience at the Law Center? Thank you, John. I'm going to um, turn my video on just for a minute, just so yeah. I yeah. It can have some familiarity, but I'm going to turn <laughs> it off because we're having technical issues with my video. But yeah. um, so Thank you, um, and thank you um, for the invite to be a part of this today. Um, and I know as the panelists, we didn't have a lot of preparation um, connecting with one another, but I am just really, I think it's profound in regards to how the panelists have all connected. And that is the thing that resonates with me in Minnesota that we, have so much work to do, but so much work that is being done and so much commitment to getting it right and getting it better in a way that families, um, that we need to hold families up with and, and to really honor um, the importance of family connection. And I could not agree more with everything that has been said so far. Um, our hope at the ICWA Law Center is to provide that exact high quality multidisciplinary trauma-informed culturally humble culturally relevant representation to parents um, and my idea my thought is that in order to do that we really have to uphold and transform in light of the lived experience the voice of the lived experience that we hear every day and the way that I think we can do that in Minnesota is through parent mentors. Um, in our office, we have parent mentors who have experienced the child welfare system, that they have navigated the system, and that have really brought to light what that experience is and how we as advocates, as attorneys, can really better represent families who are impacted by the system. I think that voice is critical. 
I think one of the things that has struck me as I've worked with parent mentors, have worked with families, and I think all of us know that if we have a family member, if even if we have a coworker that is hurting or experienced loss or grief, we know almost innately how to respond to that person. We do it in a way of giving them space, of giving them time. We do it in a way of showing up with compassion. And I often think about the very system that purports to respond to families who are in crisis, who purports to respond to families who are grieving, that we lose all of that. That we have a system that be, instead of being compassionate becomes punitive. Instead of asking families to do less, we ask them to do more in a time where they're hurting, where they're in a time where they may be even experiencing the loss of a child being placed out of the home. And that if the child protection system in a sense could be, have a softer approach, a more humane approach, a more compassionate approach, that we could transform the work that we're doing. And I think parent mentors, um, really allow that to happen. Um, in our office, um, when parent mentors, when I work um, on a case with a parent mentor, um, I, an example yesterday, we had the opportunity finally to see a client, you know, in person in their home and we sat and we ate lunch. And the questions the parent mentor was asking were things that I'll say, I'm like, wow, like I can really use that in regards to how I, we had a court hearing this morning, how I present, because she was asking questions about what it meant. She had a corner set up where she did her beating and next to it, she had a little table set up for her little guy who was five, who would sit there and draw. And she was so excited about the fact that she, this mom had space of her own. She had something, a connection that she could do. And she talked about it in a way of like, this was this is who she was. This was healing because she had lost so much time with her little boy as he had been in out of home placement while um, she was navigating the treatment system. But I think it's how we respond to families. I think absolutely we need to have services. We need to have due process. We need to have attorneys that understand the law who can advocate zealously and, and oftentimes maybe the least like person in the courtroom. But if we don't do it with compassion and with that human aspect of what it feels like for that family to navigate it, and we don't provide the hope in regards to there is a path forward, um, and the parent mentors allow us to do that because they, they meet a family where they're at, they provide a very human connection, and they can help navigate a process that oftentimes feels completely inhumane in regards to some of the asks and what is being expected of parents in a time where they're grieving, where they're, you know, maybe hurting and being continually asked to do more. Um, so my, my thought, my hope would be that every case um, could have the possibility of a parent mentor, that it's adequately funded so that parent mentors are um, reimbursed and the funding um, come through the state or come through, you know, that there's, that there's some consistent, um, sustainable avenue for funding because I think it's critical in regards to all aspects of the child welfare system. I completely agree that if we want to put ourselves out of business. So if we can prevent the need for attorneys in child protection, um, that that's really the only way that we can say we're 100% success, successful. Um, so those early times of prevention um, and for now, when child protection attorneys, child welfare attorneys are needed, that we do it in a way of compassion, that we do it in a way that's humane and that we do it in a way that people are, um, that we respond to them in a time of grief and loss in a way that's compassionate, in a way that we all, I think, recognize we would want our family to be treated. So thank you. Thank you, Shannon. I appreciate that. And we're going to move to our, our last uh, uh, co-panelists here. Um, not seeing a ton of questions in the, in the chat, lots of supportive comments for, for our panelists. So that's great to see. I have some questions, so don't worry, no problem on that. I have some roundtable stuff for us if, uh, if that's the case. But again, if you have some, some questions or comments, you would like them to respond to um, once these guys are, are, are done wrapping us up on the panel. 
I'll try to get to some of these. And if everybody's down to, to stay a couple of minutes past the, uh, past the hour, I'm, 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 I'm certainly fine too. But so, so Hong and Detrice, um, Hong, you got, you got foster advocates going in, in 2018 and you guys have really emerged, uh, with strong voices like Detrice's as kind of the, the voice of, of current and former foster youth in Minnesota when it comes to pushing for stronger commitments to the youth who are in this, in, in state care. So you guys recently saw a big win on support for higher education. I'll, I'm, I'm happy to have you talk a little bit about that and, and, and brag on it because it is a, a pretty substantial development. But what's next in terms of, of supporting the youth who are growing up in foster care, guys? Go for it. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is Hong. Uh, I'm the founder of Foster Advocates. And you know, just before I jump in, you know, just want to let folks know a little bit what we do. Yeah, I was lucky enough to found this organization in 2018 and uh, you know our name isn't you know just simply a cute fancy name it's also just what we do we foster advocacy uh, by working with fosters to create change and uh, making sure that we are making sure that Minnesota's promise is as good as you know it like should be for our young people uh, but really what makes us a little bit different than everyone else and why I founded this work is because you know, there's a lot of folks in the child welfare space, a lot of folks who are advocating for parents, a lot of folks who are advocating for children, uh, but not a lot of folks who are honoring the experience and the expertise that people who have experienced foster care bring. Uh, something that we speak with our young people all the time is that no one knows the system better than foster youth. Uh, you might have gone to school for it, it might even be your profession, but when someone spent 24 hours of their day inside the system, they certainly know it better than anyone else who simply studied it. Uh, and that includes me. Uh, my expertise doesn't come from, you know, fancy plaques or degrees, it comes from my own experience in the foster care system and not feeling heard until I was able to get these extra credentials that frankly don't do much to inform my positions on what's necessary for the child welfare space. Uh, and Detrice is gonna speak a little bit more about that a little bit later, but, um, you know, really just want to make sure that in every single aspect of the work that young people who we are claiming and aiming to serve then should be heard and should be advocated with. Uh, so one of the clear ideas that you mentioned, John, that we're just so incredibly excited about um, and frankly just didn't even know was going to be possible this, this first year that we had proposed it, but it's that right now in the state of Minnesota, uh, you know, it's sitting on Governor Walz's desk uh, and we expect him to sign it shortly, is that if you are 13 uh, or older, whether you, you know, went back home with your birth parents, whether you aged that foster care system or later adopted, 13 and older uh, children who have experienced out of home placement and formally entered the foster care system will be able to go to, to a college in the state of Minnesota that's accredited public or private with the full cost of attendance covered. That is room and board, that's meals, that's, that's books, and that is tuition. And we were able to do that by braiding current state supports and federal supports, and then providing a small scholarship uh, for whatever's left. But this is life-changing. Uh, Dead is gonna speak a little bit more about this, but when young people are turning 18 or turning 21, they age out. And something that is kind of surprising to us are, is that you know, as fosters, we didn't realize that parents stuck by their kids. Uh, what, what, like, we often ask parents um, and you know, the public to think about like, at, at what point do you stop supporting your children? And the answer is never, but yet our state has a firm deadline. Uh, you know, I never looked forward to my 18th birthday or my 21st birthday, because I knew that it was going to be me being on my own. And that's something that I heard 10 years ago when I aged out of care and something that we're, that we're hearing now. And so one of those big ideas is something that Dead Teresa is going to speak a little bit more about. And I'm just in awe of her personal power and just that she's the perfect example of why we do the work, but also where our ideas come from. Uh, you know, the foster ed bill came from our young people who said they needed hope and a place to land at 18. And at 13, they needed a place to dream about where they might head. And so Dead, Dead Teresa is gonna speak a little bit more about our big idea that we're gonna push for next. Patrice, I'll leave it to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me once again, John. Um, our big idea that um, we're, looking, we're trying to get now is um, extending foster care benefits for two years or more for fosters who need it and want it so they can have a successful transition to the rest of their life. 
this is, idea is important to me because it's not fair to fosters like myself that get cut off at age 18 or 21. We are left out here with no resources, no financial assistance, no case management. Also, it leaves us fosters to be at risk and vulnerable to the community and also to predators. Nobody pays attention. Yeah, we're grown, but we also haven't had the right guidance and the right people in our lives at the right time. I got cut off from EFC at age 21. I had just had a baby, was going to school, trying to get my life together, just moved into my first apartment. After homelessness throughout foster care, I didn't know how to bank account or nothing. I was just stuck struggling after EFC ended, still struggling with transitions now. And my case manager <clears throat> was a big support for me. He still reached out, but as COVID came, he passed due to COVID. Don't, I don't have much support anymore. Um, I never really experienced home. So when I got older, I made my own family. I used to feel like no one understood how I really felt until I started sharing my story and I found out so many other youth connected and shared similarities. A lot of other youth who may have their families weren't on their own, but I feel like many fosters as myself feel alone and stuck as being an adult without having you know, many connections and resources. Yeah, and, th and the truth, I just want to say thank you for sharing that and sharing this big idea. Uh, it's always powerful when fosters get to share their their stories and so often feel that, you know, that they're not being heard, that a system that stripped them of their agency, uh, that made us a promise. When, we, when they separated us from our family, they said that they were going to do better by us. And frankly, Minnesota's not meeting that promise. Right now, too many of our young people end up homeless and we are coming right back into the same government systems that they are intervening to prevent. One really big way is to do what Dejuice just told us that you know would have been life-changing for her, which is that you give us a lifeline. You give us a place to land and support just like any other parent would. And it's the same approach that we took with foster ed is that you know, when young people are facing the rest of their lives without support, uh, the state can't provide them with a family that they were separated from. They can't, you know, a state is not uh, a family unit that can, you know, give advice or, you know, mean, show what it means to be loved uh, and in a regular family system. They can't give back fosters what we've lost, but they can give us a better opportunity. And one of those ways is direct cash support that will allow fosters to make that transition. Uh, it shouldn't be a big idea, but that is the one that we're going to be pushing for and one that we hope all of the panelists here will be supporting as well. So thanks, John. Want to make sure that there's enough time for any, any questions because I'm sure yeah. Dead Trees has more to say. So we so we we do have a we do have a couple of questions and before we we hit those, I, I wanted to, to just share one thing that kind of jumped out as as I was kind of absorbing everybody's ideas. And that is that um, these are pretty much everything you guys described today has a relatively recent um, investment on the table from the federal government. Um, Dr. Fair and Ali talked about um, increases in uh, quality childcare. That was, that was in, um, you know, the most recent uh, stimulus package. It may be in some, some infrastructure bill as well, uh, Shannon and Natalie talked about greater investments and in, 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 in legal counsel, but not only legal counsel, but putting people around lawyers that are going to be in parents' lives and supporting them. There is a, a new, a relatively new uh, federal entitlement investment in, in that idea. Uh, what Hong and Detrice just talked about, extending out past the age of 21 to 23, um, there's a relatively new uh, provision within what's called the Chafee Act on the federal level to allow that. Indiana has already done it. They have extended to 23 using that. So these are, um, you know, I mean, making real change often costs money, uh, but there's money on the table to do some of these things, uh, you know, uh, from from the from the U.S. government. So let me hit a couple things that uh, folks have put into the chat here as we wind down. Um, I'm going to guess, I'll leave this to anybody, but I'm, I'm going to guess the the legal folk might be the ones here, but uh, we have a we have a comment. I'm a I'm a single black parent who has uh, grew up in foster care herself um, due to abuse and neglect, and now has two children that are caught up in the system. 
uh, asking, do you guys have any resources for parents who have been diagnosed with an intellectual disability and are dealing with the CPS system? Does anybody have a good piece of advice for, for Alexis who asked that? If not, that's okay, Alexis. Um, you can email me at, at jkelly at um, fosteringmediaconnections.org and I'm, I'm happy to kind of see what I can do. Did, Shannon, did you have something? Uh, so you appear there. Oh, John, I was going to say, th th I have some ideas on resources, but I'd be happy to send an email. I think it might be easier to answer that kind of question, but like there's arms workers and some different programs. So maybe with a little more detail, I could help with that too. That's great. Let's do it the same way then. Alexis, if you're still on and listening, email me at jkelly at fosteringmediaconnections.org and I will uh, connect you with Shannon. Um, another yeah, one, this is kind of a big picture deal. How do the professor, I'm sorry, Allie, did you saw something you wanted to add? Yeah, I was just saying like I could also connect, I'd be willing to connect with her also and see if, okay. uh, depending on where she's located, see if one of our Jeremiah programs could assist. Nice. Okay, great. Um, so, Here's the question from Candace Nelson to, to all of us. How do the professionals deal with false allegations and false narratives and how do we stop this? So I'm gonna take the, the big picture version of that question and just ask you guys like, um, what, do, what do you see as the kind of like erroneous narratives that exist that, that push back against um, doing like Minnesota doing the right thing and making better investments. Anybody want to handle that one? I think that what gets leaned on is these hypothetical people who abuse systems, right? Um, and I think that that's the narrative that gets pushed that um, if we offer too much help, it somehow enables people or um, people take advantage of X. And I think that those are the narratives that I hear a lot um, around <clears throat> why we wouldn't <clears throat> or shouldn't help people, um, which we, I mean, all of us in, in this room know to be completely false. Um, and it's actually a complete, like the opposite effect that we have when we kind of support people. Um, and so that, I think that's kind of the biggest narrative that I hear. All right. Anybody else want to take a crack at that one? No, I was going to say it. I, I agree that it typically uh, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the negatives, you know, as far as providing assistance for people in need to help, particularly in the prevention area, you know, but, but in all areas is just that, that, that somehow the assistance is being abused, you know, by the, the people receiving it. Um, What's fascinating is that there's a lot of data, even for something so simple, you know, that shows that 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 is just not true, right? So we there's this fan, fascinating project going on right now called Baby's First Years. It's this big study that's really targeting those first 1,000 days that I was, I was I was talking to you about, and it's based off a, it's based off another um, study, and I, I don't remember exactly where it's, but even in South Africa. But the idea is that is is simply, you know, if I if I were just to boost, you know, folks in needs, you know, a monthly income by three hundred dollars, and and I did that compared to, if I if I boosted it like twenty five dollars, what would be the outcome of the child development, you know, if, if during those first few years of 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 of, um, of life, and what the data is is beginning to show is that is that the people don't abuse it, you know, they, they don't, they, they use it to buy books and, and read the kids and provide new experiences and do all the, get childcare. They do, they use it for the, the, for exactly what it's, it's meant for. And so, you know, one of the things I think is for, for me and what we're, we're trying to do um, at MIDE is trying to, trying to break down some of those false natives with actual data. We're scientists, right? So we can, we can design experiments and show that that is not true, you know? And there's some really good examples of, of, of that that are, are starting to pop a little bit that hopefully can loosen the grip on some of the, um, um, you know, and, and some of these false narratives essentially that are out there. Right on. Hong, I, I think I see that you have your hand raised. Do you want to share one as well? 
Yeah, uh, I would love to just jump in. And, you know, I think that oftentimes, really what I think everyone's really saying is that the system is focused on the wrong thing, right? As a society and as a country and really as a state, we are really, really excellent at punishing people. Like we do a really good job at it. Uh, but the reality that we've seen uh, both in the foster system and, you know, when children are first screened in is that punishing families doesn't create better outcomes for children. Uh, foster care is not a life-saving intervention in all the cases if the foster care system itself damages. And that's something that we're hearing from a lot of young people is that, you know, even when we are talking to county workers and county staff, after you turn 18, after you turn 21, you're recommended to go back to your previous family for that supportive network, a family that was deemed unsafe for you. Uh, in a lot of cases, that was true. In those moments, it was not a safe place to be there. I certainly would not be here today if I had been left in the home that I was born into. But that doesn't mean that uh, the, the system's geared towards really helping people, right? We really, we think of it as a analogy. Like you go into the doctor because you broke your arm, um, you know, you get a cast, you get medicine, you get bed rest, you get aftercare treatment, you get physical therapy, you get support as you build up that strength and build back up so that you can be whole again. But we have a system where the first and strongest intervention is separation. You know, if, if I went into a medical center for breaking my arm and someone was like, hey, we need to cut your arm off, we, we should be horrified. But that's what the family welfare system does right now. That doesn't leave uh, children who are going through the foster care system in a good spot, especially older youth who remember their parents and their family, it doesn't help us to heal and doesn't help, help us to really uh, get towards a more just system. So just wanted to name and speak, you know, that this is also why we back Mitchell Hamlet's uh, efforts to make sure that parents have attorneys as well, is because we know that, you know, serving families well means, like, by default means serving children well, and parents are part of family systems. Absolutely. Thanks. Natalie, I think we were a little over time, but I'm going to, Natalie had her hand raised and I think I'll let her uh, go last if she wants to add something and then we can wrap up. Sure. I just um, want to talk briefly about the role of the media and the role of community engagement and listening and upholding alternative narratives. You know, so often we, something bad happens to a kid and it's horrific and it is what we hear about and we make policies based on that one bad thing that happens to that child and in listening to that narrative we lose the complexity of what it's like for kids and families who are in the system and I think about how powerful it was to hear Detrice share her story today and how I watch the body language of everyone on this screen lean in and listen. And so listening and upholding that and having counter narratives in the media really make a difference in changing minds and hearts so we can enact some of these policy goals that it really sounds like we all have shared today. Nothing seemed like it conflicted. It all was moving towards the same thing in a slightly different way. And um, I think that's really powerful. So thank you. Awesome. Well, at this point, I'm going to uh, end it. And I, I appreciate all of our panelists for jumping on with us today to share your guys' ideas. This is a really good start. And we certainly um, hope to be uh, covering these critical issues and more in, in Minnesota through the imprint and fostering families today and working with young people um, in, in Minnesota uh, for, for years to come. So uh, again, I just want to thank everybody for joining us. Thanks for everybody who attended um, and we will be releasing this as a recording. I think we'll put it up on our, our YouTube channel pretty soon. So thanks everybody um, and everybody have a lovely Thursday afternoon.